good afternoon. It's the last talk of the day except the keynote, so we'll try to keep it short. It's good? All right. Um, I hope uh, you can hear us. Good? All right. Um, the topic we're going to talk about, MageCard, is a huge topic, and probably we can speak for hours about it, uh, not half an hour. So we try to pick the most significant part of it, uh, but there's a lot more that we, that we can talk and demonstrate. So if you find the topic interesting, we'd be more than happy to talk to you after, after this call. Thank you. Um, I'm Ziv Medor, VP of Security Research at Trustwave. And Simon Kenin with me, a uh, security researcher on the team. So we'll go through, describe the threats, um, the evolution of the attacks, um, the uh, methods of compromise, um, and things that defenders can do to defend their websites. Um, a couple of years ago, banks started rolling out the EMV cards. And back then, there was an estimate that physical skimming from point-of-sale terminals will become a lot harder, which was very much true. And one of the projections given back then in 2014 was that uh, what we're going to see is that uh, credit card skimming is going to move from the physical space to the online space, right? Because <laughs> skimmers want to get credit card numbers. They're very determined. So if they can't do that uh, physically with, say, POS malware, they'll try to get it from the, the uh, internet more aggressively. And indeed, a year later, in a best practices guide from Magento, they admitted that in countries where um, the EMV uh, standard was rolled out and those cards were issued, they saw more, more fraud uh, moving to the card not present space, that is e-commerce. So, just last December, the Wide magazine uh, published an article uh, with the list of the 10 most dangerous people on the internet. Uh, by the way, anyone want to guess who was the first one on the list? Yes, Trump. <laughs> and the second? Putin. And then, on number eight, was not really a person. Uh, they selected Magecart. And Magecart is, as I said, not really a person, not even a cybercriminal, not a a group of cybercriminals. Cyber it's a multiple groups of cybercriminals busy um, skimming credit cards from um, online merchants. Um, Want to keep the credits uh, to RiskIQ that came up with this logo and the name. And also, RiskIQ did an excellent job in researching uh, this threat uh, along with Flashpoint. Uh, we did a lot of research around that too. We'll, you'll see a lot of that. So. Um, Magecard is a very unusual selection, and uh, it just uh, reflects how seriously Wired, the Wired magazine uh, views this uh, threat. So just a quick overview for those of you who perhaps lived under a rock and never heard about Magecard. Uh, Magecard is uh, multiple cybercriminal groups uh, that skim credit cards online. They do it since 2015. But it's really gaining momentum during the last six, nine months. Um, the estimates are that they hacked uh, over 50,000 websites by, by now. Many of them were by hacking other web services or payments. Uh, so they didn't hack the websites directly. But since they used code from other services, they were impacted. Um, some of the big names that were impacted, British Airways, uh, Ticketmaster, Newegg, uh, Ticketmaster, probably you know, it's the most popular website for event tickets. Uh, Newegg, very popular website for electronics and other merchandise. Uh, these are the big names, but many, many small online shops and, and uh, online merchants. So as we said, it's very much in the news, just we picked a selection of blogs just from this month, uh, May, and you can see that just uh, there are articles constantly about it and uh, how it evolves and attacks, and they expand their uh, techniques and their targets, as you're going to see. Attacking, trying to scheme credit card, credit card information from online users is not new, right? Ever since uh, websites started uh, collecting or uh, allowing uh, online purchases uh, using credit cards, uh, 
back in the 20, 20, 10 years ago, eight years ago, they used shopping carts like X card, uh, Zen card, and X card. Uh, we saw back in 2012 uh, attacks against those uh, shopping carts. But uh, what really changed is that uh, in 2015, Magento released their second version. Their first version was released in 2008. In 2015, they released their second version, and it started to become very popular. And as we know, popular software attracts attackers, right? Um, Magento itself is an e-commerce platform. Uh, it's written mostly in PHP. It was acquired by Adobe uh, late last year for nearly $2 billion, and has two platforms. They were renamed from their earlier name. So after the acquisition by Adobe, they changed the name slightly. But one of the versions is open source, and that's the one that is most commonly used. Magento, like any other software, had, it, had its own share of vulnerabilities, uh, like uh, this one that was reported by Sukuri. Uh, we uh, saw uh, active attempts to exploit it, as you can see, more than 3,000 attempts in 2014. But things have got worse. Uh, Magento became very popular, and uh, when we looked at year 2015, um, and that's our global security pro from 2016, we found that of all the compromises we investigated worldwide, and we do it year-round, 40% of them were in e-commerce sites, okay? Which is quite significant. But even more interestingly, of those compromised websites, 85% of them were using the Magento open source platform, right? So you can say almost any website we saw being compromised back in 2015 was running that Magento open source platform. Uh, one of the main reasons why that, uh, that explains this uh, trend is the fact that uh, Magento had five critical vulnerabilities reported in 2015, and some of them, as you can expect, were actively exploited. Now, Magento were actually, uh, actually released patches relatively uh, quickly, or reasonably quickly. Um, however, as we know, many website administrators don't uh, rush to install patches. Uh, some of them are very conservative, don't want to affect the uptime of their websites, and systems were left vulnerable for sometimes over a year and uh, being hacked. When we looked at the intent of the, of the attackers, and that's a chart taken from this report, don't worry, we're going to show you a lot of very recent data. And when we looked at the data that we're targeting, as you can see, the biggest part is the green part, CNP, which stands for card not present. Or in other words, in most cases, they were targeting the credit card information that was provided to the website. They were also targeting uh, credentials and then track data, etc. But uh, let's not spend time on that. So um, let's uh, let you give let me give you a typical example of uh, uh, online merchant that was attacked by uh, uh, Magecard. A case we investigated a couple of months ago. We also investigated a couple of them just this month. Uh, but we blogged about this one, so it's uh, interesting to see the, the typical attack scenario or how they launched those attacks. So first of all, uh, here we're talking about an online merchant in Australia. Um, they started getting complaints from users who use their website uh, to buy stuff that their credit card information was stolen. Um, so what we did, we started by trying to buy something on that website as well, right? And we provided in the checkout page the personal information and credit card information, clicked Submit, and then we noticed that the browser was generating a very suspicious activity. Uh, and what I mean by that is that as soon as we hit the Submit button, uh, we saw a suspicious HTTP GET request generated, being generated by the browser to some unknown domain, mxcounter.com. Sounds perhaps legit, but anyhow, it has nothing to do with that uh, Australian merchant. It was a GET request for some GIF file. It was followed by a blob, a long uh, Base64 encoded string, which was very unclear what it contains. Um, so, you know, the first thing we did is to decode it, right? And what we saw, that it was basically a ser serialized data. All the information we provided, uh, the personal information and the credit card information, 
was actually uh, included there. All right? So clearly, there was some data exfiltration going on here. How that became possible uh, for them? So what happened, we found that the malicious script was injected into that website. Um, as you can see at the top, it's a bit obfuscated, but after the obfuscation, um, it's very obvious that uh, they manipulated DOM, added the script that uh, uh, scripted from that domain, amscando.com, click.js, script. They always pick names that look very legit, click.js, and things of that sort. The screaming script, if we look at it more deeply, uh, it was still active, we could fetch it. Uh, basically, it captures uh, in, li in, uh, in live, while the, as soon as the user provided it, captures it, stores it in a data, in a JavaScript dictionary called data, and codes it in base64, that's the B2A uh, call at the bottom, and sends it to that domain. All right. Um, recently, and that's just uh, something we saw last week, uh, we saw that sometimes they don't just encode the data, they also encrypt it with an RSA key. So they're trying to keep it even more difficult to um, decode the, uh, the data exfiltration attempts. <clears throat> mxcounter.com, even though it might sound a quite legit website, is a website that was quite recently uh, registered in Kiev, Ukraine. Clearly, an uh, Australian merchant <laughs> wouldn't uh, make, a, uh, had no intention to make requests to Ukraine. So it was part of uh, that skimming uh, attack. Um, now, when we search mxcounter.com to see if it shows or included in any other website out there, we found it on uh, 46 other websites. So that's quite typical to Magecart. They register one domain, use it for a while, uh, and it's used to skim data from many different websites. And then after a while, they switch to another domain. So the fact they don't register that many skimming domains actually makes it a little bit easier to fight it because uh, we can sync call or, or take down those uh, domains which we do on a regular basis. We work with the Abuse CH team and Shadow Server on that. All right, so I started by talking about the Magento vulnerabilities and that the fact they were exploited, but over time people did install the patches or use the patch versions of Magento. So their next target was the marketplace for Magento. Now, Magento has an extremely active marketplace. As you can see here, it's a screenshot from um, two days ago. There are nearly 5,000 extensions for Magento. Um, there are dozens, of new, dozens and dozens of new extensions every month. Many of them are created by fairly unknown software vendors. Um, and even though some of them are for security, many of them are vulnerable. Um, here is an example. Um, we saw back in 2015 a utility uh, called Magmi that uh, its main purpose is to um, easily import data into uh, Magento databases. Had a, a director traversal uh, vulnerability and it was attacked in the wild. Um, Threadpost uh, wrote about uh, our finding and then uh, a day later we found an article on the dark web written in Russian, which was a word-by-word -word, translation of thread post uh, mentioning our finding. Um, as we know, it's not just us, the security researchers monitoring the bad guys. They also monitor our blogs and our um, publications because they, they want to know what we know and they might want to use, perhaps, some of the new things that uh, are being published. So, by the end of 2018, uh, there were about 20 different extensions for Magento that were um, actively exploited, as you can see here from this article from ZDNet. Um, and, um, and then the story continued. The next thing they moved to attack are web services. Uh, web services are not just extensions. Web services are vendors that can provide scripts that do additional stuff for websites. You can see here a list of about a dozen third-party providers and what their solutions around, around advertising, uh, product reviews, chatbots, legit chatbots, uh, e-commerce conversions, so on and so forth. Many different services that are very handy for uh, e-commerce e merchants. The problem is that 
the way that works is, in most cases, the website dynamically fetches scripts from any of those services, and once they get hacked, the, the website is impacted. So, for example, if you looked at Inventa, it's, uh, they provide a chatbot, you know, when you connect a website and the uh, window pops up asking if you want to chat with their customer service or marketing people or sales people. Um, Inventa provides such a chatbot, they were hacked, and that's how Ticketmaster were um, affected. So Ticketmaster were never uh, breached directly, but since they fetched code, JavaScript from Inventa, uh, they managed to um, inject malicious scripts through that channel. So that's why we call it web-based supply chain attacks. The list of uh, about a dozen website um, uh, web providers you see here are just from 2017, 2018, again, based on the uh, article from RiskIQ, an excellent uh, article. Uh, but it didn't stop there. If you look at May 2019, this month, this month, there were another uh, seven or so uh, providers that were hacked. All right? So we're talking about a very, very active threat groups. The online payment industry in general went through some evolution in the last couple of years. Until 2012 or so, most online stores uh, used a uh, store and forward model. What that means is that when you wanted to buy something, you provided a credit card, they accepted it, they stored it in some local database, and they sent it to a bank or some financial institution to do the actual transaction. And then in 2012 and forward, uh, alternative models have been uh, suggested, first uh, by using some APIs, and later uh, uh, what became quite popular is, was the use of iframe and hosted uh, payments, uh, payment uh, um, pages or services, right? So we, the, the important thing to understand here is that in the last model of iframes, uh, the merchant doesn't get access to the credit card at all anymore. Uh, the, credit, the, the whole interaction is between the client browser and the PSP, the payment service provider. So that also impacted the way the skimming can happen now, because they can't skim from the website directly anymore, right? Because the website just doesn't have access to the credit card information. Instead, they have to skim from the client browser. So let's summarize the evolution of those uh, match card attacks over the, year, over the last uh, three years. Uh, first, there were many websites implemented over Magento. Uh, people browsed those websites, and uh, since Magento had some vulnerabilities, they were used to skim credit card information to the match card domains and servers. Then they started exploiting the extensions themselves for the exact same purpose. Then uh, uh, web providers started providing scripti scripts for a variety of purposes, and once they were hacked, malicious scripts were pushed down from those providers down to the client uh, machine or browser, and the skimming was happening from the client computer directly. And uh, it's, it's not just about Magento. Recently, we see that they're expanding the list of their targets to other CMS systems, such as uh, op uh, cloud CMS and some other ones. So with uh, that, uh, Simon's going to tell us more about the methods of compromise. Thank you, Ziv. Um, so uh, after we had the introduction of uh, what MageCard threat is, we talk about how you can uh, actually understand how they infect so many websites and how to defend yourself. Uh, so. Uh, like Z mentioned, most of the websites are missing uh, security patches, either for the CMS, for Magento, or some uh, further third-party uh, extensions they use, or for the operating system itself. Um, the Magento and uh, some of the extensions also have the administrative panels and uh, like uh, Adminer or Magmi, some utilities that you use for your website to uh, easily manage it. Uh, they have administrative panels, and in most of the cases, there is no uh, brute force protection, so an attacker uh, can enumerate those panels and try brute forcing it, or even using uh, default credentials that, uh, in some cases, uh, are not being changed. And uh, lastly, there is, uh, in many cases, no uh, user input validation. Uh, for example, the extensions that you mentioned, uh, 
uh, they had uh, user input uh, bugs that uh, uh, in, we'll talk about in the next slide about uh, unsafe uh, serialization. And uh, there could be also uh, XSS in the injection and SQL injection as well that uh, attackers could inject the uh, code into a website. So this is uh, an example of a PCI forensic report uh, that we did in Trusted for uh, also Australian merchant. And um, it's not the only one, there are many. Uh, see them later. Uh, but you can see highlighted in red are the, the main issues that. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the uh, issues that highlight red are mostly the same in all the reports. Uh, the software is not uh, up to date, and mostly all those uh, small merchants are using uh, shared hosting. So uh, if some other website on the shared host was compromised, attackers can move and uh, inject uh, to the e-commerce site as well. And uh, there is network traffic that show uh, payment details are being sent uh, to a third-party domain, uh, fatten.com, uh, which is not located in Ukraine uh, or Eastern Europe, but in uh, Central America. Uh, like Ziv said, there are many actors that are trying to do this scheming method, and uh, they are located in different uh, geographical locations. Um, so, yeah. There are many reports. Uh, some of them are more recent, and like I said, they are pretty much uh, the same issues uh, on all of them. Um, so data serialization. This is uh, the reason for the so many zero days that were in the Magento extensions. Um, in a nutshell, uh, serialization is when you convert uh, an object into a byte stream representation, vice versa. And if you don't uh, actually check the input from the user, and uh, as the user can control the input, uh, he can uh, inject uh, malicious code that uh, eventually, uh, when you pass it to the function, it will be uh, executed and uh, run on the server. Um, there are uh, many different, uh, in, in each language it's been done in uh, some uh, different way, like um, the uh, tool, Wise of Serial, you can check and uh, maybe understand more about how this is done. Um, but uh, in these cases, or mostly uh, PHP uh, and serialized uh, errors, uh, so uh, you can see on the right a typical fix for this. Just simply don't use a ser uh, serialized and serialized, just use a JSON and code and decode. It's uh, much safer. Uh, another thing to mention about the major group uh, is that uh, the hacking efficiency. Like uh, they've mentioned earlier, they try to uh, expand their attack surface as much as they can, uh, in infecting uh, third party providers, and uh, they, do so, they do something similar in uh, how they inject the code. Um, now Magento uh, has different classes, and uh, there is a different payment methods. And the, there are, like, this example, there are five uh, different payment methods. Instead of uh, injecting the code to all of them, they inject it to the uh, master class, so uh, they, all those classes inherit from it. So they simply uh, went to the source, uh, so they just simply injected in one place instead of many. And this is how it actually looks like. So uh, we have the clean version of the, the same class and the malicious version of this class after they injected their code. And in this case, uh, <laughs> we're uh, kind enough to name it the send CC number. Uh, sometimes it's obfuscated and uh, less trivial to uh, see that. But they just simply hook on top of the Magento code to send the, all the credit card, uh, credit card data to the servers. So how we can actually defend ourselves against uh, the threats and similar attacks? Um, I mean, we're talking about here about e-commerce website, but this can be uh, done against some other websites as well. Uh, the attack uh, methods are fairly similar. Uh, so even if you don't have a commercial uh, e-commerce website, you should uh, uh, implement those uh, defense mechanisms. So first of all, the, as obvious, you need to make sure that uh, your web server and the operating system and the software is all up to date. Um, if you, for example, extensions. If you don't use an extension, so why to have it installed? It's uh, just a more wider attack surface for an attacker. There uh, could be there is no some uh, known uh, attack for this extension today, but when someone will research it, they will find bugs. So 
just remove unintended extensions. Um, the checkout page uh, in your website should be as much as uh, static as possible. Uh, you shouldn't load any for party scripts. There. It should be just payment, and that's all. Um, uh, today and yesterday, there are many talks that uh, cover these topics as well, so I don't uh, go in details. Uh, CSP and SRI are very important things that you need to implement uh, that uh, they could minimize or even uh, protect you against uh, a breach. Uh, like uh, yesterday, uh, Lucas from Google uh, was talking about some even uh, newer techniques uh, that simply uh, won't allow uh, loading code from different domains or uh, if the integrity of the script has been changed. So check those two out. Uh, they could help you uh, against a breach. And of course, if you have uh, full access to the server, you can uh, deploy a WAF, obviously, a web application firewall. Um, we have trust uh, using mod security. Uh, and uh, we deployed uh, several uh, layers of uh, defense, like an onion. So first of all, we uh, block the CVs, the, the bugs itself, uh, get uh, specific attacks. Um, also, uh, we check for known IOCs and domains that are being used. And uh, we also did the uh, fuzzy hashing, uh, which is uh, looking for a partial uh, match for a known uh, block. Uh, and we actually, um, um, sorry, uh, yeah, fuzzy hashing basically checking, uh, you need to, uh, the files that you want uh, to hash. And uh, this simply we have the code that is the scheming code of the uh, match card uh, group. So uh, after you have it, if you, there is part of your match for a similar code, it uh, will uh, let you know. So uh, mod security is open source, and uh, you can use it as well. Uh, uh, team today uh, showcased the core rule set of it, and uh, we actually. Uh, published those uh, rules for the Magento uh, attacks uh, as part of a blog, so we could uh, use them uh, as well. And uh, there are different uh, solutions, like IDS, uh, you can see here uh, uh, detection of uh, uh, magic threat rules being used for uh, known uh, domains and uh, certificates that are being used by the Magic group. And lastly, there are free uh, vulnerability scanners that can be used specifically for Magento. Uh, it will just take time, I mean, uh, but it will take you less time to scan your website uh, than doing an incident response after you have been breached. So if you have a website running Magento, just scan it and uh, it will uh, reduce uh, the attack uh, surface for the hackers. Thank you, Simon. Um, so, um, as you perhaps noticed, uh, within Trustworth there are a couple of teams that are involved in those investigations, like our incident response team and a couple of research teams, uh, including Victor Hora, uh, who contributed to a lot of this research. Um, I also already mentioned Shadow Server and ABCH that help us uh, tracking down many of the skimming domains, or taking down, so excuse me. Uh, huge credit to Jonathan uh, from uh, RiskIQ and Willem de Groot. Uh, both of them are excellent resources and researchers uh, for this threat. And also uh, Colin Martin from HBC for reporting domains to us. Uh, these are great resources about MageCart. Uh, feel free to take a, a photo. Um, many of them uh, con continuously publish uh, uh, blogs and articles about Ma uh, MageCart. As you saw, it's an evolving threat. So almost every week, certainly every month, there's something new about how they launch those attacks. So to summarize, uh, MageCart is a mega threat affecting a very large number of websites. Um, its evolution responds to the um, evolution of the security standards and the uh, online payment uh, industry in general. Um, overall, we see common security issues that allow it to, to be successful. And pretty much it's the same steps and actions that can uh, minimize the risk of being affected. Um, and uh, bottom line, you know, as many uh, attacks, in, especially wide-scale attacks, great collaboration and information sharing across the industry 
help a lot. And there are some good resources, as you saw previously. So with that, uh, we're done. Um, any questions? Yes, please. But what actually happens after one of these sites get hacked? For instance, some, some JavaScript and it's compromised to a third party? Like, who picks up the bill? And then what's the matter? Is anybody getting fined? Or what's the Yeah, so the question is what happens once they manage to compromise a web service? What we see most commonly is that they uh, embed their malicious script within the script that the web provider provides. So when the website's dynamically, like you think, for example, Ticketmaster, how they use the chatbot, they fetched scripts from Inventa. Uh, those scripts included the malicious code. It was pushed down to the client, and from there, the skimming happened as, I, as we started. Um, so the bottom line is almost always trying to skim data from the client, and almost always when they do the checkout process. Right. Uh, who pays for the theft, I see. Uh, well, that uh, depends on the contract, perhaps, between the user and the website. Um, as far as I know, in most cases, the website is not liable, or at least it will be very difficult for users to sue the website. In most cases, the credit card company will issue them a new card, and if it's being uh, abused, then they will uh, try to cancel those transactions. Whether that's going to be successful and how pain they're going to go through to get those that money back, well, that really can vary a lot. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, are there any you know, public or private sources of threat intel, if you will, of these activities, if they're still going on, and you know, spike and things like that? Too? Yeah, so the question is about threat intelligence. Uh, one of the best sources is RiskIQ. They have a portal called uh, Passive, Total. Passive Total, which you can register, it's free. And there they have the list of skimming domains published continuously. Uh, for the last count I saw was over 1,200 skimming domains. So the, it's a large number, but it's not terribly large. It's very man still very manageable. Uh, other questions? No? All right. Thank you very much.